Hello, everyone. Good morning. I am Noemi Lardisaba Gado, your host, together with my friend Jane Rimachao from Blogwatch Citizen Media. The session on social media without the internet is an avenue for you for you to know what is currently out there in terms of alternative platforms to reach the offline audience. This will be your takeaway when you return to your respective countries, organizations, and it'll be something you can now harness when appropriate and relevant situations occur in your lo local setting. So let me give you some background. Almost 42% of the world's population has access to the internet since to January 2015, a rise from 35% last year. There are many millions of new users who access the internet because mostly of mobile phones. You can access this data at wearesocial.sg. You can download the whole study or 300 pages of it. So show of hands, what region do you belong? Do we have South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, a lot of Southeast Asia and a lot. Uh, how about America? Okay, uh, you have no problem there. You, you're well connected. Okay, next. Fifty-eight percent of the world's mobile connections still come from more basic feature phones, meaning many people will be unable to access online content even if they'd like to. So you can see the data behind you. Um, it's 58% um, and then 38% are just smartphones. Next slide. The cost of acquiring a phone and maintaining an active mobile connection continue to represent a significant proportion of household expenditure in many developing nations like the Philippines. In this example, 58% of mobile subscription do not have data connection. So I'll turn over to Jane. Okay, because majority of total connections worldwide are still on feature phones, those who have the least access to information that can help them make better decisions and even save themselves in times of disasters are those at the grassroots level. In many third world countries, oh, that includes the Philippines, this lack of adequate information or access to current news is easily exploited by politicians. Health and, and education can improve if only more information could trickle down from the internet-connected communities to the grassroots. Bridging the digital divide has been an issue for some time now. The platforms you will encounter today are the beginnings of this bridging of the digital divide. According to a United Nations report, internet access is a human right. Do you agree? All right, Mani. So being aware of the limitations of the internet, I'm always on the lookout for social networks or anything that can reach me off to the offline audience. And somewhere in mid-2012, I was introduced to Bubbly. Anyone heard of Bubbly here? Okay, we have one. You who uses Bubbly? Okay, Bubbly is a social voice service working across feature phones and smartphones. For feature phones, users could record or post their voice by dialing a short code and speaking. And they can also listen to popular posts. I was aware that 99% of my followers were using feature phones. So they listen to my audio post by pressing a short code. When I record the 90 second audio <coughs> post, my followers receive a text message, then listen to it by dialing a short code. In the beginning, I would share the same content from Twitter. And then I spoke in English, not knowing who my audience was. And it was still growing. But I, suddenly, in 2013, I was curious. I, asked, I started to engage with them. May I know who you are, uh, where you, where you, what province you are? And then they were speaking to me in English, in struggling to speak in English. And I started to speak in Tagalog so I could be more friendly. And that was the start of our long engagement. They were interested to learn about anti-corruption issues, the pork barrel scandal, the Mama Sapano clash, and anything about being a citizen and being an involved citizen. So that really warmed my heart. Since I have a food blog, I also give instructions on how to cook adobo in 90 seconds. And that also got a lot of hits. <laughs> Noemi and I had similar experiences because I've been using Bubbly also. And um, 
I started to shift also from English to our national dialect. But while Noemi's posts focused on food, which is her forte, not mine, I used my business background to talk about how to save money, how to find a job. And these posts were overwhelmingly well received as those in the grassroots realized that these kinds of tips were going to help them. We mapped our followers and we discovered that they covered the country from north to south. Here is a slide showing my Google map. So the ones in blue are Luzon, yellow is Visayas, and red is Mindanao. Mindanao is one of the, the people who live in Mindanao actually are from the remote areas. Many of these pins are not in big cities, but in small, often remote regions. We've used bubbly to broadcast typhoon signals, weather forecasts, earthquake information, and discuss current events with our listeners. Believe it or not, and I, I was so shocked about this, many of our followers, especially in Mindanao, the red one, have no TV and no radio. They just relied on Bobby. The Philippines also sits in the Pacific Ring of Fire and, in one of the, and is one of the top countries considered vulnerable to natural disasters. We had a 6.2 magnitude earthquake in Bohol last year. And a few months after, devastating Typhoon Haiyan killed so many of our countrymen. Even with the best preparations, local officials and their families were also extremely affected. And with electricity down, communications were very difficult. So alternative modes of communication under such dire circumstances then become crucial to saving lives. Today, you will hear stories from our speakers about how their platforms are used in different ways and by people from all walks of life. As you listen, think about how these platforms may apply in your own country, in your own situations, because this may just give you some ideas also. So we have four speakers today. Let me introduce them four in a row. Samir Seth, on my left, works as a vice president for Bubbly, a voice blogging platform, and is responsible for the 360-degree operations for Bubbly in Asia Pacific. Ricardo Bahage Jr., over there, is a national coordinator and project manager at Computers Professional Union. He will speak on Voter Report PH, which uses the frontline SMS and the Ushahidi platform. Lisa, I pronounce your family name. Just tell me Lisa. Okay, Lisa K is customer development lead of Engage Spark, a Cebu-based social enterprise. She will talk about Engage Spark that involves engaging communities and staff using voice calls and SMS. Marina Azkarty leads the global marketing for Open Garden, a pioneer in peer-to-peer -peer mesh network the networking technology. Open Garden is a creator of Fire Chat, which you probably heard from the Hong Kong Umbrella Revolution. The first mobile messaging app that works even if there's no internet access or cellular phone coverage. So watch out for their talks and see how it can apply to your regions or countries. Thank you, Noemi. Thank you, Jen. Lovely start. Hi, good morning, everyone. I hope it's a great morning for all of us. Uh, good sunshine outside. Uh, my voice is loud enough to reach everyone. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, why not some of you who are standing at the back can come in the front? We have enough uh, seats available in the front. Now's the time. <laughs> of course, we don't bite. <laughs> yes, great. So, by the way, anyone here who is not familiar of social media? So, all of you, of course, are uh, familiar of social media. Anyone who is not using a smartphone, but having an ordinary phone, uh, which we call feature phone. Okay, good. One, two, anybody else? Three, four. Okay, great. So still some people are using the feature phone. Uh, tell me the feature phone users, uh, how do you use the social media using your phone? Uh, can you? No, you cannot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, great. Well, social media nowadays, uh, you believe it or not, social media is the largest activity on the internet. We all know this. Uh, people like to talk about the politicians, whether they like it or not. They like to talk about the celebrities. They like to talk about uh, food, restaurant, weather, anything. 
तो सोशल मीडिया इज चेंजिंग द वे वी एक्सप्रेस आवर थॉट्स आवर एक्सप्रेशन टू द ऑडियंस एंड दैट इज अ वेरी क्लियर फैक्ट नोएमी हैज जस्ट शोन यू सम प्रेजेंटेशन अर्लियर about the penetration of the internet and the mobile phone across the globe and when we talk about the particular region let's say southeast asia we see that internet is uh, approximately it is 30 to 35 percent uh, people can access the uh, internet where mobile is certainly giving you the good number in the countries like philippines indonesia the emerging markets there the penetration is uh, up to 110% uh, and that is perhaps due to some people are using the multiple sims uh, they are having two sims or three sims so numbers are good but yes uh, undoubtedly uh, mobile phone penetration is uh, much higher uh, than internet and any other media uh, well i was also reading uh, one blog uh, that to also from uh, philippines uh, the title is that i came to know about the earthquake before my president day so this is the kind of uh, the strength of uh, the social media actually is in today's world uh, well uh, now coming to the bubbly uh, because these are the common facts we all know noemi has already expressed all the facts to you uh bubble motions we emerged with this idea only uh, especially in the emerging markets uh, in south asia particularly where the internet penetration is lowest across the globe it's only 19% here 30 35% in the southeast asia but if you see the population so here the population is almost half of the world's population with such a little penetration of the information or information age so that is how we emerged the idea of uh, bubbly uh, so that people can use the social media even without the internet so what we did is that we integrated uh, the social media uh, the voice blogging services with the help of telecom carriers in the respective countries uh, over the ivr over the sms or over the umb so that the people can just dial in and they can access uh, some information about uh, their uh, top celebrities or uh, about peer to peer so we are having major two uh, categories here one is about the celebrities where the people can access the celebrities something like mom blogger uh, which is noemi philbeat that is jane so they are some of our premium uh, content providers in philippines so similarly we have more than 1000 uh, premium uh, bloggers across the globe who are proactively updating the blogs and uh, sharing the information with their followers information can be all about anything it can be about the information just uh, pure information about the news uh, information dissemination uh, for the disaster management or pure entertainment by some uh, artists famous singers music bands or about anything we also have peer to peer so because people in this part of the world they like to talk they love to express uh, themselves so they can create the blog just by dialing a short code if they are using uh, a very simple basic feature phone or they can download our free app from uh, app store or uh, google play and they can register themselves for free and they can start uh, playing around create their blogs share with the friends and so on so here uh, we started the concept in 2012 and uh, as of now we already have around 48 million uh, active subscribers across the globe and philippine is uh, our most active uh, user base across the globe i think uh, we should applaud the, for the filipino bloggers and uh, they are really doing a fantastic job we are having almost 7 million users in philippines alone uh, so so this is what about the bubbly bubbly has really uh, done quite well in some certain uh, uh, conditions let me share some interesting facts about uh, about the bubbly for example in the recent floods in jakarta 
I know there are uh, one or two of you from Indonesia. They can also see uh, one of uh, the picture over here that is uh, near the Hotel Indonesia uh, circle. And uh, recently, just last month, there was a massive flood that happened very early morning due to the very heavy rainfall. And uh, that was a working day. It was Monday. And all the small kids, they had to go to the school as their routine. Uh, but other channels uh, could not, of course, uh, it takes time to broadcast information, to, di to disseminate the information using the official channels. But somehow some school uh, principals and administrators, they use the bubbly to broadcast the information. And thus this information could reach uh, to the parents, uh, to the guardians, to the students on time, and they could avoid uh, any uh, unforeseen situation uh, in the city. So this is how it helped a lot. Uh, well, let me also same time give you some uh, another interesting story is from uh, Japan and Vietnam, if somebody is from uh, that part of the world. Uh, Vietnam school, Vietnam and Japan, they are non-English speaking countries. So they are using the bubbly because it supports voice. So they are using this uh, platform for practicing their uh, voice blogs, for uh, practicing their uh, uh, all their assignments over the voice and uh, their coach, their professors can see all their uh, assignments over the voice and they can mark it accordingly. It is becoming very popular because it is apart from the education, it also involves a lot of entertainment part because apart from uh, the voice, the students can also upload their interesting pictures with their peers. And so it is something like your Twitter and Instagram over the voice. So that is how it is generating a lot of uh, interest among the youth. Uh, and though the platform is not meant as an educational tool, but uh, I mean, users are the one who know how to actually exploit a platform or how to actually utilize a platform. Uh, presently, we are also working with the, uh, the Indonesian NGO and uh, we are trying to use uh, the bubbly as a platform to disseminate uh, the information in case of disaster management because there are also that region is also very prone to the disasters so friends uh, this is how we are trying to help uh, the citizens in fact not we the platform is uh, designed in such a way which is so interoperable that with a single sign on the smartphone users, feature phone users, even the big screen users all can access the information. You can also download the app if you have the access or you can simply down, uh, you can simply dial uh, asterisk asterisk 2000 from any Philippines number from any of your phone and you can access the information. Well, I will be available for the questions and answers around. So uh, uh, we will certainly discuss uh, on one to one during that session. Uh, over to the next. Uh, I'm Rick Bahage uh, from the Computer Professionals Union. Uh, CPU is a group of uh, computer professionals, some technical people. Uh, united into bringing technology to the people. So we deployed different kind of technology for nonprofits and other grassroots communities. This particular project is not really a an app that you can download and then you can use. It's it's a combination of various open source tools created by other people, and then we thought of um, combining them and then offering that platform to the grassroots. For a particular, uh, this particular implementation is for um, what we call Bolt Report TH. If you're familiar with Bolt Report India and Kenya, those are the those are the first election monitoring uh, platform or efforts created using uh, these tools. So we replicated it in the Philippines in 2010 and then the 2013. Um, what is different for Bolt Report TH um, as what we have been doing with CPU is always people plus tools. It's not you go to the community and then you give them the tool. You go to the community first, know what 
their problems are, and then you try to find tools that could help them. So that's the way we do things with, with CPU. <laughs> um, so why is it important to monitor the elections? I don't know if, how many of you came from a country that is using automated elections? Is there anyone? So one in India. So most of us are using, uh, uh, have election on the manual form. Okay. So we have reasons for, for doing that. Um, one, elections uh, is supposedly the, the most basic part of democracy, where you ensure the people are uh, can vote uh, secretly, and then there is a public counting of the, of the votes. And then the problem is when you do automated elections, you encounter lots of problems. It's, it's contrary to that uh, basic uh, principles. So it is important to, to monitor the, the elections. And so to help grassroots, uh, this is what we, we use. First, we, the, the project started a year before the actual elections. On that preparations, what we did is educate the people on what is the automated election and then how to use the machines. And then we created checklists wherein they could just follow those checklists and then those uh, written on the checklist, those are the things that they're going to report on election day. So it's a, 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 a lot of effort before the actual monitoring begins. Um, and then while we're doing the trainings, so that's for about a year, um, we're also developing the platform. So basically these tools, um, SMS Sync, uh, also from um, um, Oshahidi, and then back then uh, Frontline SMS. We also use Frontline SMS um, with SMS Sync, and then back then Frontline SMS, I feel, we feel that it's not that friendly yet for, for administrators. Uh, so what we did is we created is some simple site wherein the texts are all consolidated, and then some little programming. So these are the tools, and then we have base, this this project basically uses SMS. So we have those tools on the on the headquarters, and then we propagated these numbers to the volunteers. So uh, th that that's where the one year pre preparation on education comes in. You, you are able to propagate these numbers for about a year. So we partner with other organizations. So this one is Contra Daya. Um, and, yeah. and then we have our own number. And then this, these numbers are all consolidated on that platform. During election day, we have volunteers. Um, these volunteers, because um, in 2010, our first lesson is we tried to implement some sh some keywords where in, like if you're texting about if you're reporting about uh, a particular anomalous or 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 fraudulent activity during election you, you you use some keywords and then it gets consolidated but on that experience um, most most volunteers or since they are basic masses i mean peasants uh, um, uh, workers they, they are not able to like memorize all the short codes all the keywords so it limits the reports that we got. So what we did for, for the 2013 election, we just told them, this is the number, report whatever you see on the checklist. No keywords, no, no, no kind of uh, pre-coding uh, to do. So just report it. So that's why when you do that, um, you'll, get not, uh, you'll get reports that are not really relevant for the, for the actual election. So you get reports asking for loan credits, I mean, can you send me five pesos and then I'll try to report? So you get lots of that stuff or say, hello, how are you? So the machine is, uh, since the, the, the one receiving the reports are, is a machine, it will not answer. So they'll try to, if, if one volunteer sends a report, and then it will try to get a feedback from the machine. But then during the training, we, all, we already told them the machine will not answer. It will just receive the report and then just assume that the report was already received. Don't ask anything on the machine. But you still get lots of those stuff. So that's why we have a team of volunteers working um, in three shifts. Because in, in the Philippines, the elections uh, for 2013, it's on May 10. And then it will have like two to three days of counting to get the uh, results. One particular uh, 
one particularity of the Philippine election is that we do not vote for, like for the case of India, on this day or on this month, they'll vote for a certain position. And the next quarter, they'll vote for another position. In here, we do it all in a day. We vote for president, senators, mayors, and whatever count on the precincts gets summarized on the town level and the provincial level and the national level. So it's kind of a messy uh, um, 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 election, I mean, on, on the, uh, the flow of, of those data. Um, so during those um, trainings, we were able to, to encourage some, because what we did is during, before election day, we actually printed some IDs. So we, we got some uh, uh, support from different per, uh, personalities or, or groups. We printed some IDs and we were able to, to give out some 38,000 volunteer IDs. So that's like 38,000 volunteers uh, during election day. We have 90 provinces in the Philippines. So we ensured that we have one at least coordinator per, per province and per town. And then we have recent level uh, uh, volunteers. So the idea is these volunteers during election day, after they vote, they'll text, they'll, they'll stay there for like one or two days and then report whatever anomalies or frauds that they, they would see uh, using those numbers. So these are the interesting things that we found out. <clears throat> um, uh, by the way, for, for the volunteers on the headquarters, which are working in three shifts, uh, we, we ensured that on that on a particular batch of volunteers there is one that knows Ilongo because in the Philippines we have lots of dialects so while we are we can understand English and Tagalog in the in the headquarters we have reporters in Mindanao that will say will report in Visaya and then we have reporters in 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 northern part that will report in Ilocano so you have to have a, a volunteer that at least knows how to translate those dialects or languages into Tagalog or English so that's why we have like a filtering team that filters all irrelevant reports and at the same time those that that team also translate uh, those uh, SMS reports. So for particular uh, 2013 election, we uh, cleaned some 1,050 uh, data, data points from around 5,000 reports that we got. So we have like 4,000 garbage report and then we got 1,000 relevant reports and then from the 38,000 that you expect you are expecting to report because you gave out 30,000 IDs you just have 5,000 well well that's that's how uh, that's the experience that we have so for the 29 report the the 10 the 1,000 reports that we have we we broken it down into different categories so we have reports more on uh, PICOS errors we call the machine as PICOS recent counting optical scanner machine so this is the machine being used in the, uh, during the elections. And then we have various um, rejected ballots and stuff. So during the 2013 election, this is what we found out, uh, that there is a widespread malfunction or, or machines breaking down, 46%. And then the Comelec during the first day said that there, is only, there are only 200 machines that, that, uh, that failed. But then on our own monitoring, based on the volunteers that we got, there is actual number is some 266 machines. 266 machines would be equal to um, 26,000 voters, not being, their votes not being counted. So these are the sample reports that we, SMS reports that we got. Uh, like for this one, um, it says that the machine is just blinking in some yellow light and then conks out. And then another report saying at 1.44 p.m. Um, the, the, the machine will not accept ballot, but so some paper jumps is happening. And then we have reports on actual transmission problems. Since those are all the, the reports on the present level are, are sent to wire to wire to through GSM. So there are areas where in uh, telco network is not that good, so you have uh, reports that being received on, on the higher levels. Uh, so for so for particular case, we have some um, certain problems. We have lots of uh, failures, so it affected the whole national counting. 
So it delayed the counting. They're expecting to to proclaim a president by one or two days, but then it drags the election. So so these are the sample regions we have which which have delayed um, reports. And then there are some cases of black propaganda still. Um, some voters missing on the voters list, so they are not able to vote. And then we have um, we have ballots that actually interchanged. Um, one barangay in Baguio and one barangay in Mindanao, they have the same barangay name. And then so the, the, ballot, the ballots were switched. So those two barangays did not have election during the day. <laughs> um, so we have failures of elections. And then we have in the Philippines, it's, it's uh, state forces that are not allowed on the precincts, but we have reports like this. So, yeah, so the whole, you're going to see here, the whole automated election is, is a bit not, um, I mean, is that smooth? Um, so, I don't know, in your country, is, is it like a peaceful elections? <laughs> in here, it's rare that we, we can have peaceful elections. This one is a, a report for the 2010 elections. This is amazing. Um, the actual automated machine reported that there is a registered voter of about 153 million. That's the machine count. How many, how, how big is the population of the Philippines back in 2010? We're not even 100 million. But then the machine recorded that it has 153 million. That is amazing, right? <laughs> so just to conclude, this whole project is a, is a bit not really uh, it's a combination of getting people engaged and then providing them the most simple tool that they could do to they could use for the for whatever reporting that they're going to use they're going to do so moving forward we're we're looking for <coughs> other partners in the uh, in the local scene such that we'll have more volunteers and we're adding new tools for this uh project such that when 2016 came comes then i don't know we will have more quality reports, more volunteers, and I don't know if we're going to have a different election. <laughs> um, hi, I'm uh, Oisa, and yep, I'll be uh, talking about the tech startup that I work at, Engage Spark, which is a not-for-profit social enterprise based here in the Philippines um, in Cebu City, which is an hour flight south of here. So uh, yeah, so this is, that's me. I love horses, that's the most important thing, more important than my last name. It's me at a rodeo in the Philippines. Um, so yeah, we're um, also passionate about allowing people to uh, share their voices with, uh, in the simplest way possible um, and to communicate information to them in the simplest way possible. So besides just um, SMS, uh, it gives practice SMS text, but also the tool that works on any phone, um, any of those phones, a smartphone, a feature phone, or your original dial phone uh, called the voice call. Um, so you might have heard about Typhoon Haiyan, which devastated the Philippines uh, in November 2013. So international NGO Mercy Corps and their partners uh, created a program called Tabanco, uh, which gave mobile cash transfers to 20,000 survivors of the typhoon. and. Uh, just won the 2015 Global Mobile Award for Best Use of Mobile in um, Humanitarian or Relief Work. And as part of the program, they wanted to do a, or they did do a one-time uh, financial literacy training with the recipients of the cash transfers. Um, but they also wanted to do ongoing training using mobile phones and do quizzes to find out whether or not the recipients understood the trainings. So they use Engage Spark to send the mobile messages and receive answers from a quiz. So they, or you, you can go back to that one. <laughs> so they modeled their stories after a very important form of media here in the Philippines, which is soap operas. Um, they wrote nearly 30 soap opera style stories about a Filipino couple named Ben and Joy, uh, where the couple would talk about daily financial issues that they were going through. For example, should they save money for their daughter's school, or should Ben use the money to gamble in pack fighting? Um, which is, <laughs> that's really a problem. Um, at first, Mercy Corps was only going to send the stories via SMS text message, and the recipients would text back 
uh, you know, text one for cockfighting, two for our daughter's education. Um, but we suggested also using pre-recorded voice calls where uh, the recipient would receive the call, hear the soap opera story play out, and then press one for this answer or press two for this answer during the call. That's nice. uh, so they decided to do both to test the effectiveness, um, which they sent some recipients the stories via SMS and some the pre-recorded voice stories. And uh, this is the results from one batch of the stories. They did 11 uh, stories in this batch. So this is the results of the SMS polls for uh, 6,987 people. And so the total poll question sent was 76,000. Um, and they received res uh, responses from 5% of those people. And out of those, uh, you know, some response questions, exactly like Rick was saying, were, who is this? Or they, you know, they would, can you send me load? Um, so, uh, but there, so there were actually about 1,600, or there were 200 and, 2,263 valid responses. And out of those, 74% got the right answer. Um, so that was really good for Mercy Corps. They were able to see that uh, their training was successful. Um, and then this is the result of the voice polls, which they originally did this for fewer people, 1,226, um, because a lot of times people see voice calls as more expensive than SMS text, so they don't tend to do them. Um, but the total number of responses was 37%. So actually, um, as many people, like they, they got as many responses for the voice calls, even though there were, you know, one sixth of the people um, and a similar ac uh, accuracy rate. So they, um, about 72% of people got the question correct. So um, we joined Mercy Corps in talking to program recipients. Our team um, visited a lot of the recipients to find some of the reasons the voice call engagement was so much higher. Um, and one pretty obvious thing is it costs something uh, generally for a recipient to send an SMS back, back. It's possible if you use a short code or some other things, but sometimes that's very difficult to set up, especially last minute. Um, and it doesn't cost the recipient anything to respond to the uh, voice call poll. They just get the call and press one or press two. Um, and then additionally, the voice call was very engaging for participants. So they really loved listening to it um, from coming from, I lived in the United States originally, and uh, you get a lot of, hello, please vote for Obama during election season, robocalls, and you get really annoyed and screen your calls during election season. Um, but these type of people, they had never received a, an automated voice call before, they loved it. We asked them how long they thought the messages were. They said 10 minutes, the, the messages were two minutes. Um, and they wanted them to be longer. They loved them. Uh, so soon after this project, uh, Typhoon Hagupit hit the Philippines and was originally on the same path as Typhoon Haiyan had been. So Mercy Corps already had these contacts in uh, their account on Engage Spark. And so they were able to act immediately um, within 24 hours and set up a quick disaster preparedness alert message to send on the behalf of the humanitarian community. So these are just a couple examples of messages that they sent, you know, how to prepare, um, do the next one. And, uh, you know, telling people, please monitor these announcements and uh, don't listen to rumors. We sent out the, uh, the numbers to call for emergency hotlines. Um, and people really appreciated those messages and uh, would text back replies uh, not asking for load, but saying thank you for not forgetting about us. And we um, really feel like we were very cared about. Um, so I wanted to mention another innovation that we use at Engage Spark uh, that also makes use of the great voice call technology. Uh, and a lot of low income communities already do this around the world in especially Africa and East Asia. Um, they use voice calls as a way of signaling another person by doing, uh, in the Philippines, it's missed call. Uh, Africa, it's flash or beep. Basically, you 
call someone and then hang up before they answer. Uh, and the telecom providers hate this because they can't charge anyone for it. Um, and then, you know, that, that can act as a signaling mechanism and say one missed call means I'm going to be there, two missed calls means I'm running late. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which probably happens a lot in those countries mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is another great way that low-income marginalized groups can share their opinion. For an example, um, an NGO could advertise over the radio, here is a local issue uh, to share your opinion, do a missed call to this number to vote yes, do a missed call to this other number to vote no, and then they can collect the reports, um, and it would be free. Also, people could self-register themselves uh, using EngageSpark for a mobile campaign by doing a missed call to a phone number and EngageSpark could immediately send them back um, a voice survey and then they could, all that would be free. They can just press one or two and to get all the answers. So um, just to show you quickly the tool, uh, you can send your campaigns, engagements, contacts, and reports. Um, you can pick which kind of message you want to send. It does announcements, alerts, polls, um, just very easily set, uh, set up your messages. So we wanted to create a tool that you don't need any tech savvy to use. If you can use Facebook, um, you can use this tool. Because a lot of the NGO people who are very good at doing these types of programs, um, they're not that technologically sophisticated. Um, even I, you know, I'm, I've worked in corporate tech and I'm not that technologically sophisticated. Uh, you can insert um, customized data, you know, the first name, translations, keep going. You can set up the second step, um, um, what your contacts are, and then the third step is um, you launch and send, and then you're done. And then um, do the last slide, which is then you can view uh, reports. Basically, you know, if you ask people what is your number one daily concern, um, here's just a sample, you know, physical safety, food, nutrition, and you could very easily see um, what people's responses were. So you can actually uh, do this to to test it out, if you write down this phone number and send a text message to it with the country that you're from, um, so you're ready, it's a, it's a Philippines phone number, so if you're international, it'll be, a, it'll be an international text, but uh, plus six three is the Philippines area code, and then 915-865-2123. So that's 6391-586-52123. Uh, with the name of the country where you're based, and then um, I'll tweet my an L L K A L two one three. If you text that number, I'll send you. A, it'll, it will automatically send you a message with that. Yeah, yeah. I'll repeat the number one more time. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a slide with it. Uh, six three is the country code. Two or yeah, six three is the country code. Nine one five eight six five two one two three and then text the name of the country and after this session i'll tweet um a graph with where people are from from this session um yes i put a so when if you text that message you'll get an automatic reply back and it will give my twitter handle and it will also give you the hashtag that I'll, that i will use uh to post that so you can check that right after the session <clears throat> so um, I work for Open Garden. We publish an application, a mobile application called Fire Chat. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of Fire Chat, especially in the context of the Hong Kong elections. Um, so what? What I'll do is uh, maybe just talk very briefly about the technology. Um, this is a picture that was taken at Admiralty in Hong Kong. Um, FireChat, what the technology does is that it, if you have FireChat on your phone, um, the application will sniff around for other phones in the vicinity that are also equipped, and it will establish a direct communication with the other phones so that you can communicate without um, a cell network, or an internet access. Uh, of course, when you have a lot of phones um, that are close by and a high density of fire chat users, um, the data can just hop, 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 and it creates what we call a daisy chain. 
and then you can cover kilometers on end without any network. So this is what happened in Hong Kong. Um, in Hong Kong, we had um, 100,000 downloads in the first 22 hours. And eventually, after one week, uh, there was half a million fire chat users. This is a place with 7 million people, you know? So, <laughs> um, next one. I have more pictures of Hong Kong. Um, yeah, so this is what Time Magazine said. Uh, this is another picture. What's really unique is that um, we've come to... Um, so mesh networks have been around for a long time, and, you know, FireChat is maybe the first time that the promise of sharing network um, is delivered to scale. Uh, you can basically create your own local internet just with your phones and a free app. This is the mesh network. Uh, so on your left is a traditional networks with a one centralized node, typically a tower. Uh, the mesh takes the network to the edges by uh, connecting the, the other nodes. Uh, yeah, so we have some pictures of where FireChat was used. This is Burning Man. Um, it's in the middle of the desert. There is no network. Um, this was the first kind of massive usage uh, of the technology. Um, so this is where we are right now. Um, there are very different ways, many different ways that uh, the technology can be used. Um, so one is, of course, uh, in, and we're seeing this in Latin America a lot, uh, in highly dense um, populations and, and, and urban centers, people are using it as a free way to network door to door. Uh, and actually, the first usage of that was uh, in April last year when the, the app was just launched. Uh, the first spike was actually in Iraq. Um, there was an internet outage. And in one weekend, 40,000 people started using uh, FireChat to just communicate with their neighbors. Um, so that's one. And then in places where there is just no connectivity, but you do have clusters of people, um, you can just create your own local internet. And so in the future, we think that those networks can also be used um, for people to do things like gaming or mobile payments uh, using the same peer-to-peer -peer, um, technology. Um, we know it's going to be useful in emergency situations. Um, we were seeing small spikes, you know, every time there is a disaster um, related um, situation. Yeah, so this is our latest um, product. So it's our first device. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beacon. Um, and it's basically a way of uh, increasing the density of uh, of of, um, of nodes. So this mimics actually a, a phone, um, and so you just place it somewhere, and then what it does is um, it stocks messages, fire chat messages, and then transmits them to anybody who walks nearby uh, who also has fire chat on their phones. So this is our answer to you know the the drones, uh, the balloons, uh, you know, all these type of solutions are coming up now um, where we're coming to the realization of A, the, um, the smartphone penetration is skyrocketing everywhere in the world. Uh, B, people are so hungry for data and exchanging and communicating. Uh, C, the towers just can't cope. You know, it's really expensive. It takes a long time. Uh, and so what are the alternatives? And so we have the balloons, we have internet.org, we have, you know, all of these things. This is an inexpensive way of also creating local internet. Uh, and so the reason why we're here is um, to connect to civil society, um, NGOs and nonprofits. We want to understand how we can help you um, do your work and, and reach to um, communities. I have a few pictures of uh, more situations where fire chat was used. So this is Paris in January um, after the Je suis Charlie events. There was one million people in the street. So it's the biggest uh, demonstration since the end of World War II. Uh, there was a tweet that we, did, we didn't do anything there. Um, there was a tweet that went out in the morning uh, from the French government saying, um, somebody in the French government saying, Download FireChat before you go out. Um, and then in one day, we had 12,000 downloads. And we know that people have some pictures of what people were talking about. Um, 
Yeah, so this one slide before where I just explained. Yeah, so there's about 1,000, 100,000 conversations that day and people were helping each other like, oh, this metro station is completely saturated. Don't go there. Oh, this person is feeling um, unwell. Try to help her, etc. So you just see this is what the app looks like. Um, so you, right now it supports uh, pictures, text, uh, links. And um, there is at the top of the of the screen there is the name of the chat room, and then there is a tool for sharing um, with your friends. So the link that takes you to where the conversations take place in the app is shareable everywhere on SMS and email, etc. This is Vanilla. Uh, Pope Francis came in January, uh, and so we partner with um, a local news organization, two local news organizations called Rapler and GMA Networks. They did um, a new form of um, live reporting for us, which was kind of up to the minute um, news on what was going on on the ground. Uh, I have some screenshots also. Um, yeah, so they were saying, oh, the Pope has arrived, uh, oh, the Pope kissed the baby. Oh, this is great. And so it was a mix of the journalists talking, the people reacting. And of course, we know that this um, online usage, because the app also works online. Um, and so you create these vast chat rooms around one topic. Uh, we know that this online usage that was driven by media also uh, triggered off the grid message. Of course, we can't see those messages if you're not physically close to the conversation. But this is what we could see from the online uh, users. So if you want to experiment uh, with the app, uh, we've created a chat room uh, for RightsCon. Uh, and so what you have to do is just get the app uh, on getfirechat.com and then follow this link um, from, uh, from your mobile. Just enter it in the browser of your mobile and then you'll be able to um, just join the conversation that we're having uh, about rights gone. And it's also a way in situations like this, like a conference for people to stay in touch uh, after, after an event. So it creates its own community. Maybe we'll just go back to, yeah. We just won, for example. We'll just leave that, um, maybe the slide in the, the chat. That's it. Thank you. Okay. So we're ready now for questions. Uh, any question? Yes. Can you, can you come up to the mic, please? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Anthony from Access. So, uh, <laughs> so because you know, Access is focusing on digital security a lot. I guess, like one of my main concern uh, for FireChat and also for all the other apps uh, presented today is like the security issue. Like, what what is the security level? Uh, for these kind of apps and how uh, accessible for the security information for the users and how easy for the user to understand and defend themselves uh, to avoid from the adversary attack also from like stabs. <laughs> so like I, uh, this is my question. Thanks. Okay, can we can we have those questions uh, answered very briefly so that we give that to exactly. Marina? So you're right, it's a really good question. Um, so FireChat is a many-to-many -many messaging application for now. Uh, so everybody can see all the messages. I and mean, we've always been very clear that there was no privacy. We encourage people to use pseudonyms if they want. Um, so you know, you sh we're always very clear that you shouldn't type anything in FireChat that you don't want anybody else to see. Um, so yeah, and what we also do is create verified accounts uh, for trusted voices. So typically in a situation like a protest, you would have you would want to have a journalist, for example, saying, uh, "This is my voice. I'm standing for what I'm saying." So yeah. Um, yeah, our uh, CEO is from um, a Silicon Valley with three corporate data uh, company startups and exits before he moved here. So um, and I, I worked with a, an NGO before, and just with some of those backgrounds. It's so difficult, of course, um, so many communities, but uh, I, I guess personally and then with our um, organization, everything is encrypted. You know, we try to um, make, you know, very clear uh, 
um, anti-spam policies and there are uh, similarly like um, you can't just log in and send a million messages um, you know we can will flag that instantly and block it uh, but I think that is super critical for a lot of these tools um, if you don't have somebody coming from that kind of background who knows the digital security measures uh, that, that need to be in place because this is people's private data um, that they're sending back. So. Yeah, about the bubbly. So we are basically registering the user based on the, uh, the local SIM, which is used uh, in your mobile phone. Uh, so spamming is no issue because uh, we are sending the pass keys to that particular number for a verification, number one. That is only possible if somebody is cloning the SIM, but then it is beyond our control, then it becomes an issue for the telecom carriers. Uh, that is one. Number two, about the content. Uh, yes, so this becomes a real uh, concern for many of uh, people. Uh, so what we do is we are doing uh, uh, the moderation on the content. So we have some certain tools that moderate the content and we try any abusive or uh, as any language uh, which might hurt the community. So we are trying to do that. But again, there are some challenges when it comes to the local languages like uh, perhaps uh, uh, Filipinos or Indonesian because our tool may support the English language very well, very accurately, but may not support uh, that accurately to the local language. Then we have to depend on the uh, manual operation. So this is how normally we do uh, when it comes to the security. Hi, thank you for your presentations. Um, I have a specific question. My name is Sita Penning and I'm with New America's Open Technology Institute and the Data and Society Research Institute. And I had a question for our gentleman who talked about vote report. Um, I was really fascinated to hear um, the extent to which you have this vast volunteer network. And it seems like, I, I, I guess I wanted to know um, what research or feedback you've generated from that volunteer network, because it seems like one of the biggest outcomes potentially is like the community that's developed around this work and the possibility for that community to continue doing civic participation and other forms of political engagement. Yeah, um, actually for the community, it's, it's a, um, a aggregate of all the volunteers that generated also by, by partners. So what we did is uh, we have our core volunteers. So that's one, that's the volunteers manning the headquarters. So that's around some 30 to 40 people. So mostly students, who, who, is, who speaks different languages. Uh, and then our partner organization, so th those really are their volunteers. So they just um, broadcasted our number and then um, there. So we used, they used our number to, to report. Um, then we ensured like a thousand, at least one per town. So that's a thousand and five hundred volunteers, uh, coordinators that um, that's we are maintaining. Because uh, every since election is every three years in in the Philippines, so they are the um, and we are again using the same technology for the automated elections. So um, we have been um, um, coordinating with them on on updates and stuff. But the thirty eight thousand mostly most of them are volunteers by other organizations. So what we have is around some two thousand uh, volunteers that is really our our own. So we, we are continuously engaging with them because, um, yeah, election is, is again coming and the same technology. So we're hoping that by 2016, it will be an easier thing to do because the same sets of tools and stuff. So let's see. Uh, I'd like to add also, because we're partnering with a uh, computer professional, that it is the volunteer is not just for election day, that they have to also watch their vote. And this is one way we will continue the engagement after the election. So that's another, that's where we come in. So uh, the next question, sorry, it will be next. Hi, uh, my name is Jody from HIFOS, Regional Office of Asia. We are based in Jakarta. I'd like to ask questions on the election portal. We're actually running a similar <laughs> election monitoring in Jakarta, in, in Jakarta and then expanded to seven cities in Indonesia. We built apps 
on mobile phones that citizens can report. Well, what I would like to ask is uh, how do you engage the, the government? I think this case probably come like on the yeah. entries that generated from your project. How, how are they responding to them? Yeah. So for both report PH, we are actually a member of, we have this ele automated election system watch uh, like three, three years before the elections. So it's a collaboration between different IT groups, of computer professionals. So different groups. Um, at first, what we did is to educate the people on what as, what are the dangers, what are the advantages of the elections, and then we created some materials for, for, for the public. And that group, AS Watch, which is both report and CPU is a member, we've been engaging the Comelec even before the, the actual implementation. Um, they, I mean, um, to the point that uh, when you go to the Comelec office and then they see that you are from AS Watch, you're not able to enter because <laughs> <laughs> they already know you that these people are always saying uh, the way the election will not do good and stuff i mean we have a uh, third we have extensive research uh we have 30 vulnerabilities we call it 30 vulnerabilities and 30 uh, how to fix those vulnerabilities if you fix those 30 things then we can go on with the elections we, we presented that to the public officers we have we even have one or two of commissioners uh, supporting us but then uh, they just want to do to, to go on with the automated elections so just like uh, um while the comelec did not heed uh, our, our our whatever we engagement we had most of the most of the predictions that we had before the election it happened so we have problems on on transmissions we have problems on we actually have ballots that are larger than the feeder <laughs> and then the teacher had to cut that ballot. And then when when the the whole ballot box were in the were, were, were in the machine is put put on top, some some teachers would have to like um pound it with a ruler such that other ballot could get in. <laughs> so we have those kind of problems that even before election day, even before the implementation our network, both report and all other uh, IT groups have been engaged in the public that these are the dangers. We're doing it for like a year because we implemented it for less than a year. And it's they say it's good, it's, it's great. And then, so with the reports that we had, that that's what, that, that's what happened. So this is a question for Lisa, I think. Um, so how worried are you about novelty effects for these interventions? You said that people were really excited because they were using, they were getting called for the first time by these robots. The fourth time is significantly less exciting. Um, th that seems like a concern. Um, so again, I think that we found that uh, in a very interesting way for like, so where are you from, may I ask? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we kind of have this, I'm also from the US, um, and I don't know how many other countries robocalls or autocalls are really a negative connotation or really a thing. Um, but I mean, we sent these people a lot. I mean, you know, there were 11 automated calls and um, the response rates increased and the accuracy of the response rates increased. I think probably also because um, they, uh, knew how to reply, you know, press the key presses at that point. They were very familiar with it. They understood what was going on. Um, and so honestly, like, I think it depends on the context that you're in and if you're sending valuable content to those people. Um, so I think that's really the key for the NGO at that point. So, um, you know, of course, when you get a robo call, usually it's spam. Um, and if you are a government or NGO or, or uh, you know, even a business and you, um, you know, people, you basically have to subscribe people uh, with Engage Spark. You don't, it's not like there's a list of numbers that you can just send to. Um, so generally that's what you would basically do is just you need to make sure that your content is valuable. But yeah, I mean, they sent probably 30 calls and the response rates really increased each time. Anyone want to have a question over here? Okay, I'll go to you. We have uh, 10 minutes for questions, so let's uh, have as many as we can. I'll be quick. 
Um, hi, I'm Liz Irex, uh, international nonprofit organization. I was just wondering uh, about the localization of the apps in how many languages um, they're available. Thank you. Um, so quickly for Engage Spark, it's available in 200 plus countries, pretty much every country in the world, and um, we do support Unicode. Uh, the app itself is not for for a startup, so we we're doing a lot of li um, live programs, but eventually the app will be. Uh, you know, our goal is to have it translated into every language. But right now, you can send messages in any language. Uh, yes, localization is very important, uh, especially for this part of the world, where not all the people are English-speaking people. So for us, uh, uh, because our uh, app is also supporting the IVR, so people can dial uh, a particular short code. Uh, thankfully, the telcos have given us a common short code uh, in the respective countries. For example, in Philippines, uh, we have asterisk, asterisk 2000. In Indonesia, we have 52000. So when the people, for example, in Indonesia, they call 52000, so they get all the menu in their own language that is in Bahasa Indonesia. So if uh, the people who are in Bangladesh or who are in uh, India, so when they are calling, they are getting entire information uh, in their own language. And moreover, because it is based on voice, so voice is certainly in their own language. So uh, that is the another beauty of uh, uh, the language parity. Yes. Um, any question? Okay. I'll, I'll shoot two quick questions for Rick. Um, you, you have all these volunteers, you can clean out the rubbish um, text coming in, but how's vetting? Um, how do you vet? the accuracy of the information coming in and and for Seth, um, what's the lag time in moderation? Because it could be very easy for um, false um, alarmist messages to, to get out there. So what's the lag time? Yeah, so for the betting of the reports, actually it, it's a simple, because we are also concerned that we, we're gonna be taking away uh, some reports that are actually, for the volunteer, it could be irrelevant, but it's actually relevant. Just, what we did is just simple criteria. If it's asking for a load, asking for who are you? <laughs> Pretty, uh, just those uh, those two main concerns and then some very obvious uh, uh, SMS text. So we are, um, yeah, we are sure that most, even if like the message is cut, cut out or, or, some, or for some reason it's not the whole message, we have other volunteers that will translate that that um, message and then hopefully get some sense of it. Although for the trusted volunteers that we have, what we do is we actually call them back. Yeah, so yeah, that's one. If like somebody reported in Cavite that some machine is being taken out of the proceeds, if we got that report, we immediately call the, the trusted reporter. But if, if, if it's coming from a random report, we normally do not uh, call back this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, to answer uh, the second part of uh, the question. So first, like any matured uh, platform provider, even we, uh, for every time, for the first time user registration, we have the privacy policy uh, to agree upon by the user uh, before entering into the platform. Uh, number two, we strongly believe uh, that instead of blocking Educating is more important. So we timely uh, educate our all subscribers in their uh, native language by sending the text messages on their phones. Uh, we try to educate them that how to blog, how to share with the friends, what to speak, how long to speak, and so on. Uh, number three, uh, like I said earlier also, that we have the moderating tool but they only control only the abusive or offensive language or any racial comments. So that uh, based on the text part, we can easily control. Over the voice, certainly we need to do it manual uh, moderation, but that is uh, not on all the voice comments or on the uh, voice blocks, but that is done randomly. Uh, so our moderators, they do check and uh, in case they find any such language, they try to block that. So this is how we do. 
Um, I was just going to share a quick thought too, which is that, I mean, a couple of these issues like verifying uh, reporting and, you know, uh, determining whether something is offensive or not, this is stuff on the internet or on these kinds of these kinds of platforms as well. So I think um, it's probably those, you know, there's probably other panels later in the, the session that are dealing with those things because that's something that we all um, deal with. So that's just something to uh, take into consideration. Yeah. One, one, one thing also that we added is that uh, while we capture all those what we think are relevant reports, we have other partners like uh, one with Contradaya and then another group that is monitoring the elections uh, through <laughs> workers. So what we did is we make those reports available to them and they'll, they'll be the one to filter out which reports is relevant for them. So in a way, uh, we are able to capture all the reports and then offer other networks that would be reporting about uh, engagement of workers uh, using uh, on the election day using the, the, the platform. So we have those kind of layers. A bit, a bit uh, if you would say, a bit manual or, or uh, would, would uh, lengthen the time of reporting, but it's a way for to ensure the data are, are going into, or, or, or the relevant data are going into the, the particular sectors. We have one last question here. Hi, I have a question for you as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I come from Sri Lanka and we came through a very uh, sort of landmark election in, and we had a similar, not a similar, it wasn't as elaborate as this, but it was working on WhatsApp and SMS. But I was just curious to know, is there any interest from the community or the volunteers that are giving in the information do they want to know the outcome or is there any access for them to uh, know some of the results of that information? Just curious to know how that works. So if, if, if the volunteers are able to get, get feedback from the... Yeah, no, I, I like since they're contributing, because this was some, yeah. one concern that came up, they're giving in the information, do they know what the outcome is or the results? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, the presentations that I used here is, uh, is a modification of the report feedback that we did for the volunteers. So um, uh, while the system will not immediately send back a thank you message, uh, after the election day, we see to it that at least on every town that we did some trainings, we report back this whatever outcome that we have. So it's a, it's a, it's a way to encourage them that in the next election day, it will be the same thing that we're going to be doing, and we have to do it better. <laughs> OK, so that wraps up our session. If you have any questions to our speakers, um, you can contact me after, and then I can email you a soft copy of the yeah, soft copy of the introductions. Or I just have two extra here. So I hope you uh, learned something, and you can take back some of the technologies in your NGO or your organization. Or We'd your like to continue the conversation. So if any of you, even after RiceCon, uh, suddenly have ideas for your own country, we would love to hear from you. Our contact numbers are there under Blog Watch feel free to email us and tell us what your ideas are. Thank you okay. so much.